So um, I introduced you guys a little bit to NMR, and there's three or four of you who have had some experience with NMR spectroscopy. Um, we're going to have plenty of opportunity in the rest of today and part of tomorrow we'll be talking about mass spectrometry, but um, I am actually an NMR spectroscopist, so I have an affinity to the idea of NMR. And we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of, of uh, software for metabolite identification and quantification. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to spectral deconvolution, and then I'm going to just dive into this NMR tutorial. And then you guys are going to have a chance to uh, work with the software. Now, one of the things I think we were doing, and I don't know if we had any opportunity when people were settling in, how many people were able to successfully download their Konomics demo? The most. How many were not able to? Maybe that's the best thing. If it doesn't sound familiar, then maybe. <laughs> but um, okay, good. All right. So um, we're going to talk about spectral deconvolution, and this is actually a, a general truth uh, about a lot of of mass or NMR or any kind of compound identification process in metabolomics. So we're using NMR as a model, but it actually is the same sort of concept that's used and reused in GCMS, LCMS, MS, other things. Um, so we're going to learn about deconvolution, and we're going to learn about compound identification, compound quantification. These are the fundamental pieces of, of metabolomics and, and modern metabolomics today. And as I say, the, the model we're going to use is some NMR-based one, partly because it's a little easier to learn. Um, and we can get some software that's fairly user-friendly. And we're going to use this to try and actually work with a real biofluid spectrum. So I, I showed you this picture before, um, though I think the, the annotation was missing it. But this is just to reiterate this idea that there's the quantitative or targeted metabolomics, and then there's the non-targeted uh, approach. The quantitative one is where one we're going to emphasize in this course, and one that is, I say, more and more frequently done in, in the community. Whereas the chemometric method is the historical method. It was one that was used, uh, and still can be, and in fact still represents the majority of, of uh, applications, um, where it's more a pattern analysis. The quantitative one means you identify things, so all the peaks have labels, and you quantify things. So all the areas under the peaks are, are measured. So metabolomics is, is a bit of a laggard uh, when we compare ourselves to other omics techniques. So genomics um, has been able to make many of its great strides because of a certain program called BLAST and a certain database called GenBank. So if you sequence something, you can use BLAST to find matching genes and therefore actually annotate it. Uh, we can use RNA-seq as other methods, same sort of thing. We can not, not only annotate but then quantify so we can get information about transcript abundance. So all of that information is at our fingertips. It's on, on the web. Some of you have done a little bit of proteomics or have heard about it, but we can use the same thing whether it's uh, 2D gels or, or mass spec methods. And we can use a program called Mascot uh, or other tools like that. And through that, we can get information about the protein identifiers. We can measure uh, how much is there, or at least the relative abundance. And so again, these are tools that are out there, and they're public. So if someone uploads a chromatogram, an HPLC chromatogram, a GCMS uh, chromatogram, what do you do with it? Um, and for the most part, people try and you know, take out their ruler and measure peaks and cut out peaks and weigh them and do the integration the old way. Um, there just wasn't historically a lot of tools for identifying and quantifying things. And that's been the thing that sort of has held us back. It's what we're going to talk about in, in this course. Um, and I think what we'll do first off is, is talk about metabolite identification. So in metabolomics, we, we talk about knowns and unknowns. Um, but then among the unknowns, they have the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. <laughs> and this comes out of a term that um, 
the former Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, um, quoted uh, in, 19, I think it was 2001 or something like that. And this is, there are known unknowns, that is to say we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones that we don't know that we don't know. <laughs> and shortly after he said that he got fired. Um, but um, the, um, the issue here is that um, we, we are in a situation in metabolomics where uh, we are able to identify things, that, that there's peaks there, but the peaks actually correspond to uh, initially something we don't know, but they are in some data bank somewhere. And the fact that they're in a data bank means that we will eventually find out what they are. In some cases they may not be in a data bank, but they're described in a book or in a journal. And if we do enough digging, we'll maybe find out what they are. Then there are the ones that no one has ever described before. No one's ever characterized. Um, the truly novel compounds. Um, some cases an exciting discovery. And in those cases you actually have to spend quite a bit of time to figure out what they are and what they look like. It's not unusual to spend two to three years to figure out what an unknown unknown is. I only know of a couple people who've actually truly discovered and characterized a completely novel compound. And I know a lot of chemists and a lot of uh, people in the metabolomics field. So in most cases what we're dealing with is identifying known unknowns. Compound's been identified, someone's described it, it's sitting there out for us to rediscover. And in many cases we're identifying hundreds of those. So that's what spectral deconvolution is for. It's to identify the known unknowns. And the idea is then to work with a spectrum, could be NMR, could be GCMS, could be LCMS, MS, whatever, by looking at us a database of pure compounds in a pre-compiled database. So that's kind of like BLAST and GenBank. Someone has pre-compiled all of the gene sequences for us and we use BLAST to search and match. So that identification of known unknowns is often called targeted or quantitative profiling. What I've shown on, on the right there is really just a spectrum, it's an NMR spectrum, where <coughs> We have deconvoluted the spectrum, and below that is a list of the compounds and their concentrations. So deconvolution is sort of depicted here. Can I stop you for a second? Sure. Because I'm getting confused about the targeted and untargeted approaches. Because I thought that you metabolomics was about targeting the compounds and then But you're not doing really quantitative. I mean, you do spectral count. It's not That's right. real quantitation. So I don't know if you have any comments about this because I'm, I'm confused in the sense that I thought that targeted is really SRMs, even in metabolomics. But, uh, for, for mass spec, it is. It's SRMs or MRMs, and it's working with isotopic standards, and it is fully quantitatively characterizing them. Uh, in NMR, it's a similar, well, we use the spectral deconvolution approach. For G GCMS, it's, it's not MRMs, but it's a spectral deconvolution approach. Um, for MSMS, um, maybe not so for quantitation, but for identification, it's an a spectral deconvolution. Um, so, or spectral matching, if you want. So, um, there, there's, there's, sort of slicing it different ways, if you want, uh, in terms of, of, of targeted and, and non-targeted quantitative versus non-quantitative. Um, the targeted uh, metabolomics largely means identifying, uh, and sometimes it's a case of classes of compounds, which is compelled by chromatography or, or methodology you use. In the case of NMR, Strictly, it is non-targeted metabolomics. You're not you're you're, you're 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 measuring everything that's there that's detectable. But it is quantitative metabolomics because you can quantify what's there, and therefore you are identifying and quantifying at the same time. Even if, even if you're approaching it, it's that's right. That's and, 
so that's why I prefer just to use the term quantitative metabolomics and non-quantitative metabolomics. Because targeted, yeah, that was a term developed for the LCMS community. It means nothing in the NMR community, and it doesn't mean a whole lot in the GCMS community either. Um, whereas quantitative and non-quantitative metabolomics is basically saying, I don't know what I've measured, <laughs> at least that's the non-quantitative, and I don't know how much I've measured, but I do know that they're different. That's, <laughs> yeah. Whereas quantitative metabolomics is saying, I know what I've measured, I know what I've measured, and how much, um, and therefore I can say what's different. So my per preference is to use quantitative, non-quantitative, but the community still uses targeted, non-targeted. So, okay, so there's some confusion in the definition, so. Yeah. Because I thought that untargeted meant I'm measuring everything. It, technically it is, Once yeah. I, I want to really ta tackle a particular compound, so then I know what I'm Yeah, and that's that's sort of what it is, but it's strictly LCMS. Is that LCMS? Yeah, okay. and it was developed by people in the LCMS community, but it, it really doesn't apply to all the other techniques in metabolomics. Okay. So that's why I that's why I say that the community has to get with it. We have to use I think the term quantitative and non-quantitative. Okay. Quick question: Do you have between absolute quantification and relative quantification? We we do. I do. Um, and again, absolute quantification is much better than relative quantification. And the reason is, is that relative quantification is defined by your reference standard. If your reference standard is not available to everyone, then you can't be consistent. Whereas absolute quantification is the same value, regardless of which country, which lab, which city you're in. We all use micromolar. It's a universally defined value, and it's one that people can universally measure. It's also the standard that's used in clinical work. Uh, we, we make it as quantitative as possible. There are a few relative quantitation assays in clinical chemistry, but those are on their way out, I think. Um, so it, absolute quantitation is your, your preferred route. So back to the point about deconvolution. So this is the example here where the blue one is an example of a mixture. It's a simple mixture, but it's a mixture. And this is an example of an NMR spectrum. It could also, uh, we could pretend it's also a GCMS or an LCMS, what is, but it's a bunch of peaks. And in this case, as I mentioned before, NMR is, is a little different than, say, mass spec, although not entirely, that typically you'll see multiple peaks correspond to a single compound. So in red, that's compound A, green is compound B, and purple is compound C. These are their NMR spectra. You can see that if you add one of each one, so one micromolar, one micromolar, one micromolar, one millimolar, one millimolar, one, you will end up with exactly the top spectrum. So you can see that uh, this contributes to that peak, these three contribute to that. Um, so just adding them together. What we try and do in spectral deconvolution is the reverse. We take the mixture and try and figure out what the components were. So it's, it's the reverse problem of saying, oh, here are my three, mic my three pure compounds. How would they sum to produce a, a mixture? So it's a, it's a little harder uh, problem, and it's one that takes a bit of work. So there are two software packages for doing this in NMR. Uh, one is uh, produced by Konomix, and another one is produced by Brooker, um, called Amix. What we're going to use today is this one from Konomix. And the reason why we're doing it is because it's actually a company that was in Canada. Brooker's in Germany. Um, it also was specifically works with two types of NMR spectrometers, whereas the Brooker is only to work with one. Uh, it's quite user-friendly. It's been around longer than the Brooker one. And it has a pretty large library of reference spectra. So that makes it useful not just for analyzing, say, blood or, or, or urine, but you could also analyze plant extracts and microbial extracts and a bunch of other things. Uh, and so this is sort of the breakdown of the different compounds that they have in their library. And what they've done is they've collected these reference spectra at 400, 500, 600, 700, 800 megahertz. These are measures of the strength of the NMR. So 
I think everyone has downloaded the software and it's sitting on their laptops, hopefully. Um, and uh, I think you have like a 30-day license, is that right? So the software itself is divided into two parts. There's a processor part and a profiler part. And I'm just going to step through this so you guys can, like, maybe you guys have already played with it. If you haven't, then this is just sort of to sort of get you tuned so that we'll have a bit of time. So the processor part is to fix the spectra. Remember I mentioned that NMR spectra, when the first moment that you read them, are all kind of warped. And it's just the way that radio receivers work, and, and, and so they need to have a little bit of massaging or fixing. And that's what the processor part's done. The profiler one is the sort of the meat of the, the thing, um, and this is where you do the deconvolution. You do it manually, um, but it guides you along, it helps you along. So I'll just sort of talk about the processor. So if you pop up the screen, it has a characteristic um, set. It has sidebars, so it's um, a sort of Windows view, but it has some um, something that allows you to track your history, what you've been doing. Uh, it has standard pull-down menus at the top. It has a viewer where you can look at the spectrum. Um, and it has a little thumbnail so, how, so you can start navigating. Uh, sometimes you'll be zooming or expanding, so the thumbnail allows you to see where this stuff is. And then there's sort of a status bar. So if you were to do this, and you're not supposed to do this while I'm talking, so you're going to do this after, but the idea is, you know, use this to help remind you of what you're going to do. So you launch the processor, and then just like you're opening up a Microsoft Word document or PowerPoint, you upload a file. So you go to File, Open, and there'll be a file there, I hope, <laughs> um, with, a, with an NMR spectrum of some kind for you to work on. Uh, it'll upload and say, you know, is this what you think you have? So 500, is it this? Uh, once you've confirmed those spectral parameters, then you're going to phase the spectrum. And so this is a case where we have things that are in phase and out of phase. And it's you know just like when you've got oscillations that are in phase and out of phase. But there are spectra where an in phase spectrum has a nice peak. An out of phase spectrum is one that looks like a, a warped or distorted or <coughs> derivative of a peak. Um, so you're going to phase it so those things disappear, that it's not too warped, everything is looking vertical, everything is above zero. You're also going to define a reference point that's called a zero point reference. It's like your ruler, um, and it's called DSS. This is a chemical shift reference. Uh, some people call it TSP. It's another type of chemical shift reference. TMS is another chemical shift reference. Um, these are silanated compounds that are added to the NMR uh, sample. And this allows you to say, this is where the zero point is. Then, an NMR spectrum, it measures hydrogen. There's a lot of hydrogen in water. So there's a huge water signal in NMR. It's not informative. We know there's water around everywhere, so we just might as well say it's not there. So we delete the water signal. Then, after deleting the water signal, after finding our zero point reference, and after phasing things, things are still going to be a little warped, a little bent. So we're going to do what's called a baseline correction, so that things are completely flat at the baseline. It just makes for a very smooth, nice appealing spectrum. So it's almost like doing Photoshop if you've done, you know, you've taken a picture and you want to move red eye, you want to uh, put things into focus that are out of focus, you want to remove the tree that was hanging over someone's head, you can do that. And this is sort of what we do with spectral massaging with, with this processor. And then the last thing that we're going to do is called the reference deconvolution, which is just basically making all the peaks look similar to each other. Sometimes they're a little wide, sometimes they're a little narrow. This just makes sure that all the peaks are basically the same size, same shape. Uh, again, it's, it's like putting things into refocus. Is it like normalizing them? It's not quite, but yeah, you could say it's, it's a bit like that. Yeah, it just, just makes it a little more fittable. So these are just some screenshots where you're uh, uploading the spectrum, so you should be able to see something that looks like an FID. Um, I think it's called rmlplasma.fid is the name. I hope if we've got that loaded somewhere. Maybe it's in the wiki. Okay. 
Okay, so it'll be in your wiki. Um, I'll be able to upload that file. It's a zip file. Then it'll just make sure that it, it'll have read some of these things. It'll say, did you use DSS? Yes, you did. How much, what concentration did you use? Um, 500 micromolar. Um, does it have a, an indicator? Uh, yes, sometimes imidazole, which is a chemical that can be added just to make sure that the pH is there. Um, is there some, you want to have autophase correction? Yes. And so these are all sort of checked off mostly for you. And so, as I say, once that's done, and it's not much more difficult than uploading a Microsoft Word file, um, this is what you'll see. <coughs> and what you really want to see is all of the peaks looking like, you know, a standard Gaussian peak, but you can see that they're warped, that there's, um, and that's called a, a phasing problem. And it's just the electronics of the instrument. Um, so it's not unfixable. And, and every NMR instrument has this mechanism for phasing. So you've seen this thing. And, and this is, say, our starting spectrum. You can see it's out of phase. You can also see the left side is higher than the right side. You can see that there's a giant, a couple of giant peaks in the middle. Those are some that we want to get rid of. Um, we can see a peak which is near zero, but not exactly zero. That's actually our DSS reference. That's going to allow us to, to put things in the right frame. Um, and so what you're doing in this processor function is you're referencing, phasing, getting rid of the water, and then spectral deconvolution, and then making sure that the left side is about the same height as the right side, which is the baseline correction. So you're photoshopping your spectrum, and it's making it much more readable. So there's different options, just like that. There's the phase correction in green. There's the base collection, baseline collection in red. There's a shim correction. There's a water deletion or region deletion. Uh, so those are the three or four that you, you, you need to use, and you can choose them. Um, so the first one we do is we do the phasing. So you choose phase spectrum, that's your option. There it is. You can see things that are a little warped or bent. And so you can slide these things left and right to, to shift up things. Things that were pointing down, they can bring them up. Things that were tilted, if you want, are, are, are sorted out. So it's just sort of sliding things around. Again, uh, a slide bar, anyone can play around with that. Um, but Every sample is going to get a slightly different treatment. Just like every photo you might take will be, you know, <coughs> slightly in focus, or red eye will be slightly worse, or so each person has to modify it. Yes, this is a this is a, it's a good point, and this is one of the central issues with with NMR based metabolomics. Um, People who are reasonably skilled will produce essentially the same looking spectrum. Um, it's just like most of us can look at a, uh, a painting, and if it's looking crooked, most of us can get it mostly straight. Um, some not quite perfect, but you know, if you've done enough crooked painting fixes, you'll, you'll, you'll get better. So it, it, it is a visual thing, but it, it's true. It's not going to be perfect. And there, between the 17, 18 people in this room, everyone's going to be slightly different. Um, but that's only going to lead potentially to about a 1% error in terms of your connotation. So it's, that's within sort of what we expect. So the phasing, as I say, just has to do with how the signals are, are collected in NMR, uh, how the receivers are configured, uh, collection of real and imaginary signals, so this is a uh, sine, if you've ever heard of real and imaginary numbers, cosine x plus i sine x. Uh, these are the way the electronics people like to think of things. Some things are in phase, some things are out of phase. You can see the one on the left under R, E, the top, uh, is something in phase. And then the imaginary component, that's the out of phase component. And that's what you're trying to eliminate in your phasing. So that's, 
if, you, if you're not an NMR person, it probably means nothing. But this is what's happening. Um, so you phased it. It's looking good. Now you're going to remove the water peak. So in serum or in urine or any extract from a plant or microbial uh, sample, uh, it's 110 molar of water. Whereas all the metabolites you're measuring are about 100 micromolar. So that's, that's a million times more water than all the other metabolites. So it's a kind of a, a big elephant in the room. And so what you do is you remove the elephant in the room. Um, and so your spectra, if you zoom out, that's all you see is water. There's nothing else. Once you get rid of it, now you see all the other stuff. There's about 50 compounds there. So it's, it's a standard trick. It's been used for decades. Um, but this is a, a way of removing the water peak. Does it appear always at the same? Appears pretty much at the same position at 4.87 parts per million. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a very broad peak. Now, the other part was uh, usually the left side is a little higher than the right side, or the right side is a little higher than the left side. Uh, this is called baseline correction. So it's just making sure that there is a flat line. And you can see that this is a this is the, the noise, this is the noise, this is the noise. And you just want to make sure that it is completely horizontal. And again, the electronics sometimes mean that it's not. And you can see, if you zoom in, uh, this is a little lower. And it kind of warps here, maybe a little higher. So what it's done is it's put in a spline curve. And this is a, a fixing method that's been used again for decades, uh, just to make sure that everything is flat. And it does this itself. You just have to look at it to make sure if it's OK. You can tweak it manually if you want um, to smooth it out. And again, this is something that people are actually very good at, but computers aren't. So that's partly why it's done in this visual way. Uh, as I say, ask a computer to move a crooked picture and it'll probably make it more crooked. Ask a human, we usually can straighten out the picture pretty well. Um, the next thing we do is this reference deconvolution. It's not absolutely essential, but it, it's often used. And this is to take your best looking peak, which is usually your DSS peak, which is the one at 0, 0.0 ppm, um, and to sort of uh, convolute or transfer that same shape to all the other peaks in the rest of the spectrum. So um, this is the this is your DSS peak, and it, it has here almost a perfect Lorentzian shape. It's, it's, it's perfectly shimmed. It's perfectly smoothed, and you want every peak in your spectrum to look like that. Obviously, not in the same height because each one is a different height. But every peak should look like a variation of that. And so this is sort of what you're doing. So I want, so some of your peaks way at one end or way at the other end will have a little bit of a bend to them. Some of them will be slightly warped. This fixes that warping so they all look the same. Not obviously say not gonna be the same height, but they have the same shape. So once you've done those four processing steps, you now have a really nice spectrum. So your, your picture has been photoshopped very nicely. And everyone will say you're a professional photographer. And that's, that's what you're trying to do with this. So that's the processor. And in a perfect world, everyone will process their spectra to look basically nearly identical. And so it's, it's, a, it's a reference point. Uh, but um, you know, there will be some differences, and, and Carolina brought this up. So between the 17 of you, there'll probably be a little bit of difference between each one. Anyways, at this stage, you're ready just to profile. You're ready to do the spectral <coughs> deconvolution. So uh, you can now pull up your spectrum, but you, you, you pull it up through the profiler. The profiler has a similar model, same sort of thing. It has a spectrum view, the big one there, just like this. It has a thumbnail, just like the other one. It has a sidebar view just like the processor. Um, but it has a couple of other things that are different. It has a table. 
which links the compounds and their concentration. And then it has a navigation tool called the cluster navigator. It allows you to move from peak to peak or group of peaks to group of peaks up and down the spectrum, left to right or whatever. And it gives you numbers. This is a, a per pentathenate the vitamin D. Um, there's peaks at 8.0, 4.0, 3.5, 3.4, 2.4, 0.9. It's a fairly complicated spectrum. And so you can click on these things and move from the left to right, back to the middle again, to see how these things are looking or where they are. So for profiler, just like with a processor, you launch the program, open the spectrum that you've just cleaned up, um, and then indicate that you're ready to start profiling the compounds and that you're working on a 500 megahertz instrument. First thing to do is to start with uh, your reference compound, DSS. This is a, it's a compound that's added to every NMR sample. It gives you your zero point reference. Uh, so you're going to try and fit DSS first. That's good practice, but it also makes sure that everything is working. Um, and then once you've finished with the DSS, then you can start fitting some of the other compounds. Once you've fitted or deconvoluted the spectrum with the other compounds, then you can export this Excel spreadsheet, which is your list of compounds and their concentrations. So you've gone from a raw spectrum, that looks like a crazy bunch of peaks, a list of compounds and their concentrations. A skilled person can do this in about 15 minutes. Most of you will take two hours. Um, so here it is, you've launched the profile. The spectrum is now, instead of being black, it's green. Uh, and then it may have identified or estimated some approximate concentrations. But that's what the profiler looks like. You're going to choose a library. Because you've done it 500 megahertz, you're going to choose the 500 megahertz library. So it means 450 compounds have been collected on a 500 megahertz instrument, each one individually, each one at different pHs. So this actually took about eight years for the company to collect all of these samples and, and cost them lots and lots of money. Um, but that's the library, and that's the one you can use. So first one is profiling. DSS. So that's a reference compound. Rosa? Um, if you are not using DSS and you are using DMS or DSP, there's no. Uh, well, in the library, there's no TMS. There should be TSP. There wouldn't be TMS, but there should be TSP in this in the library. Okay, you didn't find it? Okay. Uh, it might be listed as a, a full name, tetramethylsilyl or trimethylsilyl propionic acid or something like that. So you might want to check if it's listed under a different name. Um, so, um, but the ones that you should be looking at should be should have DSS or the ones that are in this particular example. Um, okay, so to profile a DSS, you go to zero. Um, that's where the first peak is. Turns out there's four clusters of DSS peaks. One at zero, one at 0 0.6, one at 1.8, one at 2.9. And you want to make sure that you can fit each of these. So you can see where this green line is, um, but in the dashed line is where you want to sort of move it. And so you can use your mouse and, and move the peak up so that it fits under the, the actual peak. So these are examples as you're fitting. Um, you can see the green line in this case is where uh, the subtraction is. So you've, it's what's left over. So you can see that in this DSS we haven't quite fit it fully, so we need to push it up a little bit. But you can see a little, a little hump for the DSS. We're now looking at, at 0 0.6 ppm. That's the cluster at 0 0.6. And you can see that you know, the, it's a fairly noisy black line. There's always noise. Uh, but you can see the green line itself looks pretty much flat all the way. Uh, here's the cluster at 2.9. And you can see the blue, the purple. The green line is what's left over, which is pretty much nothing. 
Uh, and then you can see this other fit here, and the green line is the black line. It's also <coughs> pretty much flat. So this is just simply done by moving things left and right, up or down, until the peaks line up, and then the green line, or what's left over, looks flat or... Oh, that's a subtraction line? That's, that's a subtraction line. line. Yeah, and if if it if you if it looks like oh, there's still peaks, that yeah, well. yeah. So you haven't you have to either move it up or shift it to the left or right. So that's as I say, just done by clicking and dragging, and you're dragging the the, the purple thing around, up or down, expanding it, increasing it. So you you'll fit those DSSs, and and at that stage DSS is fit, and you'll have the actual concentration of DSS. And it should be somewhere around, say, 490 to 510 micromolar. So you're done. Which you should know it beforehand, because that's yeah. what you set it up. Exactly. That's what you've added. But it, it'll, it'll vary a little bit, partly because no one's perfect at weighing, and, and there's some water retention and other things. So the so next thing you could do is look at another compound. Now, normally when people are doing this, they actually have a list written beside them about what they're supposed to find. So in serum, we do know what you're supposed to find in, in blood. And there's about 50 to 55 compounds that are detectable by NMR. And so from a, a list out of the 450, you can go to this sublist that has been published, our lab has published it, other... I'm not sure if Camtasia died on me or not. Um, okay, so we can now go to acetate, we can fit that. We can go to another compound down the alphabet, alanine. We know acetate and alanine are supposed to be in blood. Um, and um, again, we'll sort of shift and drag things. There is an auto fit function in economic software. So in a perfect world, you shouldn't even have to go to this process. You should just sort of say, go, and then walk away, and then come back. And, it's, um, and that's kind of what the auto fit does. Um, I haven't used it. I think this is the first, first, uh, first version of the software that's actually had this. So it'll do it. It can do it for a few of them. And if you guys can play around, this one sort of illustrates the auto fit. So it says, fit automatically. Okay, and it'll sort of wander around and, and make sure things will do that. So if you guys use this and can figure out how to use this reasonably well, you should be able to go through this exercise quite a bit faster than in the past past courses. Yes. So this is what the auto fit did, and you can see there's pretty much no, the green line is pretty much flat, so it zeroed in on it. So to completely characterize these things, you're going to have to repeat this process about 45, 50 times for different compounds. We don't expect you to finish this, um, the, uh, but the, just to have sort of the experience of both trying to do this deconvolution, seeing some of the challenges that are involved with it, and then to appreciate what we'll show you after lunch, which is some new software that does the whole thing automatically. Um, so once you've done all of the fitting, then you can export the data into a... Um, an Excel spreadsheet, and that's that's your list. Now, obviously, if you're doing a you know a real metabolomic study, you would do this for 30, 40, 50, 60 times uh, for each of the different samples, and you'd have lists of concentrations, and and you could do that. So at this stage, I think you guys have how much time do we have left? 